Very good. All right, everyone, welcome to the afternoon session for our second um, global symposium on uh, leadership and project management. Um, it's my honor and privilege to welcome uh, Jason and uh, Chris uh, from uh, Vancouver um, Airport. Um, Chris is a transportation ex executive with uh, over 20 years of experience in commercial operations, business development, and product innovation. In his current role as uh, director, Technology Development at Vancouver Airport Authority. Chris is responsible for developing and commercializing new technologies designed to enhance business value and to support the airport's community and the economies that supports it. As part of his mandate, he leads the airport's in-house technology development teams, which are responsible for the airport's Border Express, which is a trademark or symbol, um, border control kiosk, business and the airport's recently launched digital twin platform. Um, Vancouver Airport has invested in digital twin technology to not only improve passenger experience, operational efficiency, and logistics, but to also lead innovation outside of aviation, making the airport more than an airport by way of becoming the region's gateway to the new economy. Chris is passionate about rethinking the meaning of digital transformation and ensuring people-first strategy for developing and implementing purpose-built technologies and innovation. I'm not sure how much uh, the digital twin platform can clone me, but I'm really looking forward to mm -hmm. what his presentation is about. Chris, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much and good day, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Vancouver Airport Authority, it's my pleasure to be here with you today to share with you how we are investing into digital twin technology to build a better, more sustainable airport for our customers and our community, to help fight climate change, to help support our reconciliation efforts. And um, it's going to be a great presentation where I'm joined by my colleague, Jason Williams, and together, we're going to give you a little bit of a preview of our digital transformation journey here at Vancouver Airport. Um, if you hear me talk about uh, YVR, that's the three-letter um, airport code uh, for our, our organization. Um, for those that may not be familiar, Vancouver, uh, we're located on the west coast of Canada. Um, we are a non-shared capital private corporation that has the uh, opportunity and the privilege of operating Vancouver International Airport on behalf of Transport Canada for a long-term lease. So our structure, our organization structure, is a little different than many other airports in the world that may be completely run by the government or may be completely privatized. So we fall somewhere in the middle and we find that's the best way to be able to be innovative, to make change, uh, to be commercially uh, and entrepreneurial focused. And I think you'll see during the post presentation how that comes to be. So before I begin, uh, we just want to acknowledge that our airport, Vancouver, resides on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, in, back in 2018, the Airport Authority and Musqueam signed a long-term friendship and sustainability agreement. And this lays the pathway for uh, moving forward together to achieve a sustainable and mutually beneficial future for our community and the lands on which we reside. Uh, Jason and I and our team are honored to be able to, to be able to have the digital twin technology that we're developing um, to be able to support this agreement by using technology to showcase Musqueam culture and language and history, and to be able to provide meaningful employment to residents of Musqueam uh, through this exciting new technology development. A little bit about uh, Jason and I. Uh, we both work for the innovation team here at YVR. Our mandate is quite simple, and that's to invest and to develop 
new and purpose-built technologies. And I'm not talking about technologies that are kind of off the shelf solutions. These are new kind of innovative emerging technologies that we develop in-house. And our first mandate and priority is always to serve uh, YBR to serve our challenges. What we found in the past though, is if we can solve the challenge here at our airport, chances are other airports in the world uh, could benefit from our technology. So that's the second mandate is that if we come up with a, a home wing technology, we'll also go in and we'll commercialize it and sell it to other airports and industries around the world. What that allows us to do is to create new revenue streams that we are able to reinvest back into uh, innovation and R&D for uh, our technology departments. One of our probably largest successes, biggest successes in the past, was the creation of our Border Express self-service border control solution. So if you've seen these kiosks in the past when you're traveling for clearing either Canada Customs or US CBP, or perhaps at one of the international locations, not a lot of people know that that's a homegrown technology that uh, was invented here at YBR. Um, so again, uh, what we're going to show you is the next iteration of what the technology that we've been developing, and that's our digital twin platform. Before the demo, um, I just kind of like to talk a little bit about why we decided to invest into a digital twin platform. And this was during the time of COVID. We were just coming out of uh, uh, COVID. And when Jason and I were on the road talking about this technology and the reasons why, there was some real benefit to um, helping us uh, recuperate and to, to come out of COVID. Unfortunately, since then, since COVID, it's been amazing the amount of issues and real issues in the industry that we've seen. So anywhere from adverse climates. So here at YBR, we've been subject to forest fires, extreme heat, flooding, uh, just the sheer volume of the number of passengers traveling again. We're also seeing strikes with industry partners and ge continued geopolitical unrest. So unfortunately, I think for airports and for our airport, this is the new normal. And, um, and that new normal is unpredictability. So we need to do better as an airport and as an industry to be able to withstand what's happening now and in the future and just become more resilient to our operations. And then one of the ways that we're going to do this, and we are doing this, is investment into digital twin technology. Next slide. So before passing over uh, to Jason, uh, for those that may not be familiar with what a digital twin is, in the context of our airport, it's a digital replica of all of our terminal buildings, our airside facilities, our landside facilities, and all of the Muslim lands that we reside. It's a safe and secure platform that we control access to and displays data, uh, all of the data sources that we have, all of the complex systems and equipment that we have at the airport. And as you'll see in the demo, we have the opportunity to be able to display this information in either a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional view. It allows our staff to know what's happening right now at our airport. And you'll see during the demo of what's happening right now at YVR, what aircraft are coming, uh, landing, taking off, what's happening in our airspace, and what's happening in our terminal facilities. And we've also architected the platform so in the future, we'll be able to provide access to our business partners and stakeholders. This is really important as you know we have to be able to be more resilient and resourceful as an industry. And it gives us the opportunity to share data, to share that situational awareness, so that we're all making the decisions based off the same data and the same platform. So we're really excited about where we're gonna go in the future. And if we think a little further in advance, what we can do is when we start to connect our digital twin to other digital twins in the region, in the province, and the country, so that we understand the cause and effect. So if we have a uh, bunch of delays at YVR, what is that gonna mean for cargo movement within the region? So we start to get a really more holistic view of our operations and we can work together as an industry to fight climate, to fight congestion, to make the best possible experience for our citizens. Um, some of the benefits, um, some of the benefits that we have uh, for investing in the digital twin, operational efficiencies, cost reductions, 
uh, work, make better, faster decisions using data. And, um, and one of the ways that we do this is we make this available, the digital twin, to all, I think it's right now, we have about 600 employees that have access to the digital twin. We make it available on iPads, on iPhones, and the PCs. So we're really, again, democratizing data, making it available to everyone. Feedback has been fantastic. It's not meant to replace our staff. It's just meant to, to be able to provide those digital tools. And what we're finding that it allows our folks to be able to focus on more high value work and let, let the digital twin and some of the background systems, you know, run the airport and, and create alerts when necessary. Now, I'd like to pass over to Jason, as I said, who's going to take you on a tour of our digital twin. And then at the end, I'll conclude with a couple of words on how we get the work done. And then uh, happy to uh, respond, answer any questions. Thank you. All right, uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you may be. It's an absolute pleasure to, uh, to join you all. And uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for uh, the context that you set there with respect to our digital twin. Um, Jason Williams, I am the uh, manager of product here at the Vancouver Airport for our uh, innovation team. And uh, really pleased to show you a couple of different things with our digital twin. Um, the first is uh, going to be our uh, ops situational awareness tool, and I'll just flick to that right now. So hopefully that video is still working on your end, and you can see all of this. Um, maybe just get a thumbs up from the group if that's possible. Yes, uh, perfect. Let's uh, thumbs up. Okay, great. <laughs> yes, <you can. laughs> right, so what, is, what you're looking at here is a live view of uh, the Vancouver Airport. And uh, you can see here that we have a variety of different pieces of data which are showing different alerts. Uh, you can see the map of our terminal facility and obviously our uh, airside facility as well. Um, there's a few different icons that you can see around the screen here. Lots of vehicles that are moving around, lots of aircraft that are moving around. And this data is coming to us in real time. So if we were to look out the windows here at uh, our office, we'd see these uh, aircraft moving in real time. So the digital twin for us is really uh, a, a single platform that integrates into a variety of different data sets. We have our map here, we have our terminal map. This is an integration into our GIS team uh, system, which is done by our engineering folks. So we, we constantly look at that uh, GIS database and we will update this as they make changes. So we're always getting the most up-to-date mapping information, room ID information, and areas where we may have closures through that, uh, that direct integration. The icons moving around on screen, that's another integration we have direct with NAV Canada. It's called multilateration. Multilateration gives us the real-time uh, ADSB radar uh, or transponder positional information of aircraft and some vehicles, as well as enriched local radar data of uh, vehicles that may be uh, moving around on the airfield. We have a higher number of vehicles currently on our airfield just due to some work that we're doing, uh, especially in the southwest area of our, um, our, our, our terminal space, sorry, our, our airside space. Um, just due to some repaving work that's going on uh, at, the, at this time. As you can see, as I draw in a little bit closer, you can see we have other uh, information that's uh, providing enriched data to our terminal operations folks. Um, we have different point of interest that we can click on here and dive into further information. So if I wanted to, I could bring in uh, some information here on it, some security wait times that we're seeing at our international security gate. So what this is showing us is our uh, current wait times, of six minutes, uh, our predicted passenger numbers. So we've got 121 passengers going through here and the current threshold, which is based on how many security lanes are open. Now, the nice thing about this is we can go back in the past and see the performance of the day, but we can also look forward into the future and see where we are potentially gonna have issues uh, with uh, the security screening process based on how many lanes are open. So you can see here at around lunchtime, we are going to run into a bit of a capacity constraint here. So our operations team will be working with uh, CATSA, who is the agency responsible for security screening, and they'll be trying to get more of those uh, folks into those positions to open more lanes so that they can adequately process passengers. So this is not just a, a tool that is giving us 
live situational awareness. It's also predicting what is going to be happening in the future. All of that data is driven by uh, some advanced analytics that we've been uh, capturing over the many years that we've operated the airport. Um, I can bring up a particular flight here. Uh, this is an arriving flight that happens to be delayed. You can see this one's coming in from Dallas. Uh, it's telling us our expected passenger count, where that particular flight's baggage is going to get dispensed, and how many domestic connections we're expecting for that flight. And then you can see some other information about the aircraft type as well. Uh, we can click on other flights here. We can go to this one as an example. Uh, this is a much bigger flight from Paris. And you can see our passenger counts here, 319 on this particular flight, carousel 21, uh, domestic connections 29, and, and a few other um, pieces of information about that uh, particular flight. So all of those flights are constantly monitored with the flight schedule, and those passenger load factors are modeled out across the entire terminal space so that we can see where we might have pain uh, or processing issues in the future. And you can see we've actually got an alert right here. This is on level two. This is our uh, international arrivals facility. If I click on this particular one here, we can see that we have quite a few big wide body flights that have just come in and we're just exceeding our capacity with respect to throughput. So our team will again uh, actively be working to have and make sure that we have guest experience personnel in that area to help support passengers through the arrivals process. And also with CBSA, working with them to make sure that they have enough lanes open. The beauty about this is it's not just a schedule or a, a tool that we can use the day of. It is a tool that is dynamic and it changes throughout the day. So we always get, uh, you know, based on the schedule, where our peaks and troughs are going to be throughout the day will shift. And this tool allows us to shift where we place personnel throughout the terminal. So it really takes the mundane out of uh, everyone's day to day to try and make sure that our passengers uh, get the best experience when they are moving through uh, the terminal space. Some of the other uh, little features that we're uh, we're trialing here, we've got a camera on our curb side. Uh, so this is a real-time view of uh, one of the cameras that's picked up a loitering vehicle. So you can see it's the vehicle marked in red there has been uh, longer than, uh, than 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, it's obviously an issue for us because it creates a capacity problem, but it's also a secu security concern. So uh, this can be... Uh, sent as a push notification to our curbside officials and they can deal with that and move that vehicle along. And you can imagine us positioning this across the entire curb front and giving us that automated way of prioritizing which vehicles need to be moved on. Something we've also done just to enrich our data is in our, our domestic terminal, we've deployed a lot of IoT sensors which are capturing the real-time counts of passengers as they move through different facilities. So uh, again, I can click on the security point of interest here and you can see we've got our existing data uh, insights here for this particular one. Uh, you can see we're gonna have a, a little bit of uh, processing pain in our domestic security screening points as well. And you've got our historic wait times there. But we also now have live counts. So these sensors are counting exactly how many people are in this facility. You can see that there's 148 people currently in line waiting to go through security. We've got four of the five available security lanes open. And their current wait time that we estimate is just over 12 minutes. So again, way more enriched data and it's live. So it helps us understand exactly what's going on, but it also helps reinforce our existing data sets and modeling for the future. We can do the same thing for uh, our domestic airline uh, travelers as well. So you can see here, this is an Air Canada example, their regular check-in, they've got two of nine lanes open. There's only three people waiting in line there. So it's pretty quiet for them. Uh, and then their priority lane and the associated wait times here. So five minutes, just under six minutes there for regular and for priority, there's more people waiting in line there. So they're having a longer wait time. Not so good to be a priority passenger for Air Canada today. And then again, you've got the overall uh, statistics here of the live passenger counts. So you can uh, see just by diving into this, how many passengers we have moving through each terminal and each process uh, and the total for this particular hour and what we're gonna be seeing in the future. Because uh, it's GIS, we also have that enriched uh, uh, way of searching for a room. So I can just search for a room here. Oh, let me type it properly. This is a, a room ID, so um, you'd be, and it'll take me to exactly where that room is, and it tells me all the information about that room. So this is a pre board screening area, size, uh, and the security status of that area. Uh, or if I just wanted to click on one, uh, I could do that as well. So I can just click on a space here, and it can tell me that this is a commercial space, it's in the international area, it's, it's security status as well. What floor, 
very, very useful for people who are trying to navigate the terminal, especially if they've never been here before uh, and they require to go and do maintenance or things like that uh, throughout the facility. It's the biggest building in BC, so over 4,000 rooms, uh, not necessarily the easiest place to navigate if you're new. Uh, right on. So I will now move to, uh, so this is our, our, our ops tool. This is designed to support our guest experience folks and our airport operations folks. I'm now going to move over to uh, another module, which we've just released, uh, called the Intelligent Airfield. This one leverages our uh, 3D modeling capability. So uh, back in COVID, uh, during the pandemic, we had the opportunity to scan the entirety of our airfield. So we used uh, a combination of LIDAR and uh, photogrammetry to scan all of the uh, areas, so terminal buildings and also land surrounding uh, the, the, uh, the airport. And we we're able to produce this really high fidelity model. And we're obviously starting to use that uh, in, in this space here as well. So you can see this is just a bird's eye view. The data is very, very similar. But this is more focused on air side safety and uh, air side operations. So you can click on an aircraft here as an example, and you can see that aircraft's current journey and where it's headed. Uh, you, you can see its flow, and if you wanted, you could pin that, and then you can click on another one here uh, and bring that up as well, and, and you know, keep an eye on these uh, two aircraft. Really, really useful for decision making, especially when we're in an irregular operation. An irregular operation could be a snowstorm, or it could be bad weather, or it could be a peak demand hour where we have lots of flights coming in or leaving, or perhaps we have an asset like a runway out of service. These, these tools are very, very helpful for people who are responsible for coordinating all of the ground movements uh, on our east side uh, uh, area. So you can see here for each of these uh, particular journeys, I can click on here and I can see the time associated with uh, each phase of the journey that that aircraft has been in. And again, I can also take a little peek at some of the GHG emissions for this particular aircraft. Um, and this again is based on that data that we have with respect to the position, the speed, the aircraft registration, which allows us to look at what kind of engines are on the aircraft and then discern what the carbon emissions are of that aircraft. So very, very useful tools to help us track that. We've never had anything like that before. It's always just been an assumption. So what we're now doing is we're setting ourselves a baseline where we can capture all of that data. And then in a couple of months, we might say, okay, let's change our gating strategy. Well, let's change the way we use some of our runways. We now have a way of measuring the impact of changes like that. Uh, so huge benefit, not only to our airline uh, customers, but also to the environment as well. Some of the other things that you can do on here, again, it's all around uh, the airside safety and uh, usage piece. Uh, again, that GHG, uh, sorry, not GHG, that uh, GIS integration allows us to have all of our surfaces identified here. And you can see uh, all of the different aircraft that have been uh, using this particular runway and whether or not uh, vehicles have been on that runway to do uh, an inspection. So the last hour, that's how many aircraft we've had uh, on, on the runway. Likewise, we can do the same here in, in the south. Uh, again, combination of all the aircraft and perhaps vehicles, but no, no inspections in this last hour. And the same thing we can do here for uh, vehicles as well. So I can click on a vehicle, it's telling us our speed. We can generate alerts here uh, that you know, if the vehicle is going too fast or it's exceeding its, uh, exceeding its speed limit, we can, we can obviously use that. We can start to track the path of various vehicles that uh, work on the airfield. So snow, snow removal is one, or uh, you know, our, our wildlife patrols, tracking where our patrols are going and where they probably should go next because they may not have been in a particular area uh, within a given time. Uh, and likewise, uh, if we are doing lawnmowing and things like that, uh, which uh, patches of, of the, the airfield have been mowed and where would the next logical one be? Believe it or not, the way they do that now is a little bit archaic and they are really, really looking forward to using this tool to help them do that. You can see here we also have our gate uh, alerts, very similar to what we had in our, uh, in our other uh, module. Uh, again, just providing that same uh, enriched information. And if I wanted to uh, see this aircraft here as an example, uh, it should be able to take me to the gate. So we, we know we're going to stand 58 here, so I can pin that and I can quickly go to gate 58 and check the status of that gate. Very, very useful uh, information. And I'll just see there's a really relatively new feature that we have here. You'll see this arrivals swim lane. This is um, a tool that's uh, really designed to help our baggage folks. So you can see here, this particular gate has got a baggage delay. So we're tracking when this flight arrives and we're also tracking 
when bags have been entered into the system. And because we haven't seen any bags come into the system yet for this particular flight, we're creating that alert. So this particular flight, AC805, unfortunately has a 55 minute delay on baggage. We haven't seen the bags come through yet. So our baggage team will be actively working with the ground handlers, uh, in this case, Air Canada, to uh, find out why those bags have not arrived. All right, uh, you can start sort of seeing here, there's a good example. This is an aircraft and you can see it is actually in 3D. So I'll just move to uh, that 3D view. And you can see we've even got the livery of the aircraft. Uh, and this is the work in progress. Uh, so it's a little bit janky, but you can see the aircraft there is going to be pulling into that gate. Uh, and you can get nice and close there and see the, the actual gate itself. Really, really useful again for situational awareness. Uh, if you can believe it, back in December uh, of uh, last year, we had a very, very significant snowstorm and we couldn't see five feet out of the windows of our uh, operation center. So tools like this really allow us to get a digital view or a digital representation of what is actually happening out on the airfield. And likewise, we can we can do it in multiple uh, realities here. So you know you can have a sense of uh, an area of interest here in our international terminal if we wanted to, or we can move to this side here and have a look at uh, what is going on in domestic. And likewise, we can actually see what's in the local airspace. As Chris mentioned, you can see here we go to this radar view view and see what else is uh, moving around in the airspace and what is due to come into YVR. We can see a couple of what we call UFOs. These are these are aircraft that uh, won't be operating at YVR. Um, so uh, we're only interested in the aircraft that are actually coming into YVR's airspace. These others are probably private aircraft or uh, you know smaller aircraft that we don't have any interest in. Go back again. And we can uh, obviously uh, go back and uh, go to a single view if we want. Uh, and we can also change that to sort of a nighttime 3D view as well if we if we wanted to, just to have a little bit of a change in uh, the viewing options here. I just need to try and remove this uh, info panel uh, because it's blocking me from a section here. So uh, just give me a sec. Sorry, yeah. I just have to minimize that because I've got the zoom control in my way here, but uh, yeah, the basic web can... integration here as well. You can see we can pull up uh, some some information from Nav Canada here about. Uh, oh dear, okay. Excuse me, we, we we may be because I'm not on VPN here. So let me just try a different one. Okay, so this one's working. This is just giving us uh, information about our runways. Uh, you can see here the wind direction, the visibility, um, which is obviously very useful, and the status of different. Uh, equipment, so like the lighting on these different ways at daytime here. So obviously we don't have any lights on. I'll just go back to OIS to see if that reloads. There we go, so now it's working, okay, great. So what this is telling us is not only for YVR, but also for other air, airports, other major airports, the arrival rate. So what this is is a, uh, a rate that NAV Canada specified. And uh, it, it's basically how many aircraft we can land at any of these airports. So you can see here for our airport, it's 36. So we take that number 36 and we look at our flight schedule and we can say in the next hour, we can definitely accommodate that. Or if we have over 36, we're gonna have an issue, which means we're gonna have flight or aircraft that might be delayed coming in. And then likewise, you have a, 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 a restriction or what they call no TAMs, notice to airmen's down below here. Just very useful information for our airside safety folks uh, across the, uh, the airfield or also understanding what might be happening at other airports as well. Okay, so that really just gives you a sense of how we're using this uh, for really operational use. So it's not necessarily a digital twin that's designed to help uh, support future planning and maintenance, but the underlying infrastructure and the foundations of this are all there. Uh, the way this twin has been uh, sort of designed is based on a client application, which is based on our Unity platform. It's a gaming engine. So that's why you can see Hopefully it's coming through on the Zoom uh, screen share here. The, uh, the, the experience that you have as a user is really great. The user interface is very, very um, uniform and, and obviously very powerful. Um, what I uh, will pivot to is the fact that, you know, we still have other applications outside of the digital twin uh, that we can use in different ways. And uh, I'll just move to that quickly here. Um, you can see, this is a, a digital sandbox of the uh, the, the airfield. Uh, there's, there's nothing live about the data that you can see in this, but you can fly around this particular model and you can see how 
incredible the quality of uh, the scanning that we did with LIDAR, um, the photogrammetry of our terminal space. If you've ever been to YVR, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's photorealistic. It's not real as far as how busy it is at the moment at the airport. So it's uh, it's it's almost like a, a scene from a zombie apocalypse movie, but uh, it is very, very accurate to what we have uh, with respect to our facilities and the land that surrounds the airfield. This is a great tool that we can use for future planning. We can use this as a base to provide simulations. So driver simulation training, graveside operations, emergency response simulations. So, you know, if we had to model out a crisis or a disaster and play out in a multiplayer scenario, all of the different first responders that may need to deal with that situation can do that in a digital space rather than trying to uh, do that in an analog boardroom table kind of space or even a physical trial of a particular um, disaster scenario. So lots of ways to enhance how we operate the airport as well as train people who are responsible for very critical functions at the airport. As far as the accuracy of this model, so this was, uh, as I said, it was created with uh, the aid of LIDAR technology. Uh, we flew a helicopter all around Sea Island. Uh, it was about 40 square kilometers of scanning. The helicopter had two LIDAR arrays fitted to it, as well as a camera array. Uh, each camera, I think there were four, four or five cameras, each of the cameras 150 megapixels, and uh, the LIDAR was um, pixels per inch. I think it, it can get us a density of um, two to three pixels per inch. So it's, it's really, really high density point cloud data that we were able to use to build this. And because we're an airport that has existed for quite some time, all of our existing engineering drawings have all been in 2D. We've never actually had 3D uh, imagery or uh, designs of our airfields to this scale and this quality. Um, so it's great, great to offset our existing drawings and uh, infrastructure that we have. Um, and we obviously didn't uh, just do the terminal. We did everything around uh, the uh, airport. So you can see here, we've got sky train lines, we've got the roading infrastructure. I can go way back out, uh, all the way to uh, the entrance of Sea Island here, and you can see all of our bridge infrastructure, all of the adjacent buildings, everything that is involved in a passenger's journey is captured in uh, this beautiful 3D model. All right, so that's really all I uh, wanted to share with you today. And uh, I know that we still have some time here, so uh, absolutely welcome uh, any questions that you may have. Chris and I are both still here, so we can uh, take those questions. Um, but thank you so much for your time, and uh, we really hope you enjoyed uh, the content that we presented here today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, this is a really, really interesting uh, way of looking at uh, the airport and uh, adjacent um, uh, neighborhood and, you know, making risk-based uh, decision-making. So I really like that, uh, you know, digital twin here. Um, so there is a, a question here. I would like to ask that question. And then, you know, I, I have a couple of my questions as well. So um, Yash is asking a question. Um, it's a very interesting layout. How are the sensors mapped and updated in the layout map in real time, especially like uh, measuring crowds in place? So um, I think, uh, so for us, there's a variety of different things there. There is, uh, there's, there's real time data that comes to us from IoT sensors. So for our passenger counting, as an example, uh, it's a combination of stereoscopic cameras and LIDAR. So we have an array of LIDAR sensors that are constantly counting how many people are in areas. And then we get those different metrics live from uh, that physical based system. But then there's also a combination of database uh, uh, feeds that we get. So live status of flights, as an example, is uh, something that we get as a, as a feed from our, uh, our FIDS, our passenger flight information display system. So uh, all, of, all of that stuff just gets fed up into our, into our cloud-based infrastructure, and then it gets uh, broadcasted to the client application, which is what you see on screen here, through the use of uh, APIs. Uh, hopefully that covers off the, the answer to the question. I was just going to add to that, just again, going back to resilience for our airport, for our industry. One of the things we've learned the hard way through COVID or through some of the adverse weather is that we were reliant on a lot of data um, from other sources. 
And that data may not always be forthcoming. It may not always be accurate. So again, one of the bases for investing into new data and owning this platform is that data ownership. Um, and as I said, we want to be masters of our own destiny when it comes to using data the right way and not always having to rely on the airlines or business partners for that data. So again, you're gonna kind of see that continued investment into data. So that's, as I said, that we are, you know, we're, we're successful despite, you know, maybe what the, uh, the lack of data from business partners and all of that just brings up those Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, thank you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of data that's coming in, which was one of the segue questions that I wanted to ask if that's okay. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of operational data stores that you are having, like, you know, lot, lot, many, many sources of uh, data here. And this amount of data is coming in real time, but at the same time, you need to actually, you know, do some kind of ETL, like, you know, extract transfer, a low kind of uh, cleansing the data before you are able to report uh, real time on it. Um, so can you walk me through the process of how it is done in a real time scenario from multiple different sources aggregating and how you are able to report that in real time? Yeah, sure. So we have uh, we have really good feeds to begin with. So uh, when you look at things like MLAT and the feeds that we get from our IoT sensors, that real time data is already cleansed and it comes from dedicated systems. So we haven't developed our own systems to, to get that data. We've bought off the shelf or we subscribe to off the shelf solutions that uh, already provide that. So that, that obviously helps and it all gets presented in one place, which is obviously a, a great uh, form of making it more efficient for our, uh, our folks at the airport to use it. Uh, where we have things like passenger volume counting and um, things like that, it's a little bit more complex. So we use a, a combination of different data sources but we also have a dedicated advanced analytics team who are consistently going back on the historical data. So this historical data is what we actually use to forecast what we have in the future. Because believe it or not, even as an airport, we don't get real-time load factors, which is the number of passengers we're expecting on each flight. We don't get that from our airlines. We have to come up with that ourselves. So we, we get the data from a variety of different sources, historical flights. Uh, we have a machine learning uh, component that... Uh, you know, looks back at a, a large history of different flights to try and figure out for every single flight we have in the future, what we're expecting. And then we also work with our commercial um, uh, team to, uh, you know, work with them on what, what airlines expect to see for load factors going forward. So there's a lot of work that our advanced analytics team does um, before the data even comes to us. And we just take the feeds that they give us and we tie it to the live flight schedules. So it's very, it's, 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 it's pretty easy to just take all of that sort of mundane data and, and visualize it in a new way and, and provide so much benefit for the operation. Hopefully that covers off some of what uh, you were asking me. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, the reporting from data warehouse uh, is always a challenge. And on top of it, adding a visualization layer, like the way you are trying to show in real time is, you know, an interesting um, challenge um, that you have um, encountered. So I do want to ask a, a different, um, you know, uh, put on a different lens and ask a different questions, you know, in the grand scheme of things that you are trying to show over here. Um, there's a lot of data that you are pulling in, like, you know, license plate data that may be used for who's coming, what kind of, uh, you know, people are there and um, screening um, real time, you know, many information and stuff like that for people, passengers, and, you know, many other things. So uh, where is the line drawn in terms of privacy here? Um, like example, you know, they, there may be somebody who is coming from a European Union who may be bound by GDPR requirements that their informed consent has to be brought much in advance before that information can be brought, um, even though it may be in an aggregated form. So what are some of the privacy related challenges that this may actually present? It's a really great question. And, you know, we've had so many discussions about this. One of the things that we're very lucky to have had is the experience of working in a border control environment to provide kiosks that facilitate a border control function, right? So we've got a lot of experience with uh, dealing with privacy concerns and things like GDPR compliance. For us, uh, when we think about the digital twin, obviously, as uh, Chris mentioned at the top of the call, we have developed this and built it from the ground up with privacy by design and security by design. 
Um, so only you know people who have authorization to get access to certain features of this tool can have access to the features. But you'll also see that everything that I've showed you in this tool does not reference a single individual, a name, or a, uh, a metric that uh, can tie to a certain individual or, or a name. And we do that purposefully by selecting the data that only will show an operational benefit, not um, something that uh, captures someone's personal information. The sensors that we use, so LiDAR, you cannot discern the identity of a person with the use of LiDAR. The stereoscopic cameras that we use as well, it's all data that's processed on the edge. So it's processed on the device and we just get a data stream. So it's, it's all hardware and combination of software that's chosen uh, specifically so that we don't uh, need to worry about uh, capturing someone's personal information. Uh, the license plate recognition system is something that we don't even use. Um, but I, I know it is used uh, with our parking and ground, ground transportation folks. They have their own processes that they deal with uh, to maintain privacy and security because they not only do LPR, but they also take uh, payment information as well from people. So um, a totally different department that looks after that. Hopefully that covers it. Chris, did you want to add? No, yeah, it's good. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Again, extending the same thought process, you mentioned security by design, uh, privacy by design. So those are good, good concepts to leave by here. Um, but when it comes to security elements, um, this amount of information that could be potentially, um, you know, available for, uh, I'm not sure it's publicly available, but you know, what are the potential ramifications if this uh, system somehow gets hacked? or um, you know, be available for some other information that people can use it for some malicious purposes and stuff like that. Um, what standards um, are we living by? Um, what are the things that we are using to, I'm thinking of the movie um, Die Hard, if you recall, uh, one of the movies where uh, the airport is uh, taken as a hostage and things like that. So similar situation. So what are some of the things that you are adhering to from a business process and security process perspective that is prohibiting uh, malicious uh, uh, abuse or uh, at this point? That's a good, uh, a great question. And, and again, we're, we're very lucky that we have a, a very strong cybersecurity team who have a good maturity and all of the, the good practices that you need to uh, develop when you, you are know, obviously creating tools like this, but also keeping an eye on the newest and latest techniques that people um, have to try and get access to systems. So uh, to answer the question, I mean, this, this, this tool is really designed for use by approved people only and approved people only, as uh, Chris also mentioned at the beginning, only our YBR employees can access this tool. And uh, they have to have the associated credentials, they have to have the associated approvals uh, to even get access to this. There's multi-factor authentication that's involved. Uh, there's a variety of just good basic cybersecurity policies and processes that we've built into the, to, um, you know, to getting access. As, as far as, you know, like the, you know, you know using it for malicious in, intent, uh, that obviously can happen, but I mean, uh, you could probably do the same with uh, other tools like, uh, Google Earth and, and things like that. A lot of the data that we're doing here is really an operational lens on what we expect to see in the terminal in real time and what we expect to see in the future. So it would be very hard for a person or a organization with malicious intent to get access in the first place, but also to even derive some kind of uh, operational decision that would result in a negative impact for the airport. So hopefully that uh, that covers that one as well. Oh, yes, yeah, you know, I'm just so trying to just gather. Add, yeah. yeah. So it's going to add, you know, we did talk about, you know, how in the future we will provide access to uh, trusted uh, partners. Um, and uh, we're, we're not going to rush now, right? Because we want to make sure that uh, the architecture, the access is controlled and secure. So we will take our time to make sure then that when we provide access to a partner such as Air Canada, that we're only providing access uh, for data that is relevant to uh, themselves and not perhaps to a competitor. So again, lots of work for us to be done uh, in that space. We're not gonna rush it, but it is definitely on our roadmap. Definitely, definitely. Now, um, yeah, I, I completely understand that, Chris, uh, you know, lots of work being done on that particular area. Now, I do want to ask about one more thing. So I'm sorry I'm asking, you know, a bunch of questions over here because this is a really interesting uh, thing. Um, 
the, the, there is the uh, standard, the, the DO178 uh, um, standard for software or development uh, or any software that is actually used in the context of the AdBone software. D do you think this will be, the digital tool will be bound by that or some elements of that will be bound by that? I'm just trying to ask for my own clarity. Just, from, just remind me, uh, would you mind repeating the standard again? Um, it's called DO178. Um, for uh, software used in the context of AdBone safety? Yep, I, I, I think uh, that's definitely one of the ones that we're following. Um, and also just other, you know, the standard practices, DevSecOps and, and things like that are all baked into the process that we um, follow when we are um, developing tools like this. Okay, so besides the people process, you know, there are some standards that govern this particular kind of uh, thing as well. Absolutely. Um, one last thing, and then I'll definitely keep quiet. I'll promise that. One last thing. Supposing the system is unavailable for some reason. Um, what if, we don't need to go into the details, but for some reason, the system goes offline and it cannot come back. What are some of the top challenges that you will run in maintaining your airport? That's a, yeah, that's a great question because uh, that's very, very true of uh, other solutions that we've come up with for border control and things like that. When the system goes down, it can turn into um, turmoil. So change control is really the, the ultimate governing aspect that we need to look at there as far as, you know, we're replacing certain processes with tools like this, but there always has to be a backup. And that's all built into our change control processing uh, with each department, depending on what they're gonna be using this for. Um, so that's the best we can do, but we also, uh, to build all of our infrastructure and the systems that support this with the five nines of reliability so that uh, we mm. don't have issues or outages and multiple pathways for data to flow instead of just singular um, pathways. So redundancy, not just with, um, with the devices that you're using, but also with the infrastructure that supports it. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jason and Chris for you know answering all the questions. I really appreciate it. I have tons of questions, but it's not about me. Um, let, let's go to some other people who ask questions. So there is one question from uh, a person here, Yash uh, Trivedi. Um, how much impact did this tool have for the operations team in terms of uh, making it easier to monitor disaster management and traffic control versus the earlier um, analogous system? Can we have such a LIDAR-based monitoring system for detecting and alerting forest fires automatically? I think two, two, two different questions, but you know, by the same person. No, it's good. Um, I can give you an example where, uh, again, I'm going to bring up the December uh, 2022 snowstorm that we had here in Vancouver. Obviously, we have snow in Vancouver, but that particular snowfall event was unprecedented. So we had uh, like a month worth of snowfall in two hours or something like that. It was it was really bad, and again, visibility was impossible. Uh, not just for aircraft, but also for people working uh, in the uh, in the space. This tool really shone in, in a regular operation like that. We were able to see where aircraft were positioned, where they may have been stuck, and where we thought gates needed to be prioritized with respect to snow clearing. That actually helped us a hell of a lot during that snowstorm event. Um, so really, really good for, for, for crisis management uh, from an operational perspective. But then, as I said, you know, when I was showing you the 3D model, that uh, model is so accurate that it can be used for things like disaster planning and uh, scenarios where first responders can use it to practice out different events. Not just doing that maybe once a month, but on a weekly basis and going through a variety of different uh, iterations of a particular disaster. And if a disaster is big enough in the true sense of one that may occur at the airport, we wouldn't just rely on the people that we have at the airport because like most airports, we're a little city, we have our own fire department, we have our own police. We will always ask for support from outside suppliers, outside uh, agencies from different municipalities to help with scenarios. We can use this tool to help train them and get them familiar with our infrastructure in a very efficient and easy way. So there's so many uses for this. We always just say it's limited to your imagination and the ability of the uh, development team that you have doing all the work to code it. I just want to add to that. So we're also interested in, in testing and trialing uh, sensors in perhaps some of the waterways. So uh, we're located on an island. The airport is on an island, flanked by rivers in the open ocean. 
So what happens if we get a, a you know a normal amount of rainfall? So by providing the sensors in our rivers and monitoring their heights, um, and to be able to show them that um, where the cause and effect for you know a half a meter increase, what is that going to do to flooding on the airfield and and situations like that? So great opportunities to explore even more of means when it comes to, to climate and and the issues. So this this particular uh, system, the digital twin system, is this um, an initiative by the Vancouver um, uh, airport alone, or is this something that's used uh, throughout Canada or in other parts of the world as well? Yeah, so uh, I think we're about one of five airports that have invested into digital twin technology. I see. Uh, from what we can tell, I think we're, we're the most advanced. Um, and just a little bit about... Um, it, it is a little bit of a buzzword these days in the industry. Everyone wants to have a digital twin. Um, but where I think that we're, you know, ours is multifaceted, right? So it's not only yes. for operational efficiencies. Again, it, it's got a heart and soul. It's got a customer focus, a climate focus. So that puts us, you know, a little more of a leadership position. And one, one of the big uh, KPIs for us is adoption. So it's no good just doing this pretty uh, digital twin with all these images if no one is using it. So part of Jason's and my responsibility is working with the organization to learn how to uh, use this information, how to trust the data, how to make decisions. So again, adoption is really important here. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the, you know, six airports in the world, I think we're one of the most advanced, but, uh, you know, we're happy to collaborate with the industry to kind of bring mm -hmm. the benefits because we start to really see some value once we can connect our digital twins other digital twins in the region as I mentioned, so that we're you know getting more of a holistic view of the operations. If there's going to be an issue in one airport, what's going to be the impact? So that's kind of where we want to go. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's awesome. No, no, um uh, this is great, by the way. Um fascinating. Now what I'm looking here on your screen, is it is it live or is it a simulation? This is live. So uh these these aircraft are live. These gate alerts are live, um, representing flights that are going to be late. So this this particular flight here, as an example, it was supposed to arrive at three, but we're forecasting three uh, three thirty two. And I'll just this is in PST time, so it's uh, I, I know it's it's only lunchtime here, but there's an example of an alert coming up for this particular gate that's three hours ahead of time for us, but it's going to give our operational folks some time to deal with it, and uh, and and obviously help uh, support the passengers coming off that flight. Oh, this is uh, fantastic. And I would assume that um, this uh, access to this platform is going to be uh, internal for for people uh, working uh, at the airport. That's right. So we, we, we've we limited the access just internally, uh, and there's, there's a variety of different reasons behind that, uh, predominantly security. But uh, as again, Chris mentioned, you know, you know, there are definitely agencies or or other customers that we serve at the airport, like airlines or CBSA mm -hmm. or CATSA, who could benefit from having access to certain pieces of data that would help them with their operation. And again, the whole idea is that we've designed it so that we can pass out different pieces of this uh, to different agencies, so they can get the benefit that they need without competing with um, someone else. I just want to also share. So one of the, you know, as I said, we're, we're governed by um, Transport Canada. Um, they're very interested in, in this technology. And where they want to go with this is uh, in a lot of um, remote regions in Canada, we have uh, airports that don't have any air traffic control on site. But so Transport Canada is interested in, you know, creating, you know, digital twins of all of these remotes in, our, in the Arctic and our northern parts of the country. Um, to be able to be situational awareness and to be able to understand what's happening and to be able to view it in the offices, the regional offices that uh, operate these airports. So they're really interested in, you know, where this can go for, un, you know, un, unmonitored airports to be able to provide that, that view. So really cool stuff with that. This is definitely cool stuff. Yes, Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just because you mentioned, I, I want to find. I, I want to make sure that I I'm, I hear this correctly. Just because you mentioned this is a live system, 
uh, and we are recording this for you know our future audiences mm -hmm. uh, within you know Northeastern University. Is it okay for this recording to be recorded, or just want to be confirming? Uh, yeah, well, look, that's fine. Uh, we've we've done this a, a few times, and uh, we know that some of these are recorded, and uh, we've even got material that's on YouTube that uh, has been uh, gathered from live historic okay. places. That's not a problem. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thanks for confirmation. Thank, thank you very much. This is this is fantastic. Uh, you know, when you talk about digital twin technology, uh, and I said to myself, you know, the, those guys are probably kidding. How are they going to do it? But here it is, and so that's perfect. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm just uh, looking at the chat. Um, there seems to be no questions, uh, so it seems like all questions are answered. So uh, one last question. So if we would like to hear or learn more about this digital twin technology, uh, where do you think uh, our uh, listeners can go and learn more about it? Yeah, certainly just to, to reach out to, to myself and I will help uh, get the team um, ready if we want to have more discussions. Um, part of our outreach is also working with higher education. So. Um, you know, how can we help support, you know, new training, new views uh, in the future? How can we provide a cut and paste of the digital twin with some fake data so that higher work can, you know, organizations uh, and educations can use it to, to test and trial, right? That's the whole concept of the, the sandbox. Um, we really want to get in, into there in the future. A lot of students come up with, you know, uh, hypotheses or new products that they want to test and trial. What a great way to be able to do it in, in, in a sense like this using, you know, data in a real kind of environment. So definitely please reach out to myself. We can pass on our contact information. We'd be happy to facilitate any further discussions. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you very much, Jason. This is a phenomenal presentation. Well, a phenomenal drive through the entire Vancouver airport. You know, we flew through. Um, thank you very much. Really appreciate that on behalf of everyone at Northeastern and the Global Symposium and on all our learners, so listeners over here. Thank you very much. Big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, thank you. everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.